with you. And also with me. Our order of service this morning is if you happen to have a hymnal at home, you may follow along on page uh, 184 and following forward the Divine Service Setting 3. Otherwise, on our uh, website at trinitymenasha.com, you may take and open up and follow along in the order of service, and that's right on our front page that you'll be able to find that. Um, this morning we'll take and announce each of the hymns and invite you, if you would like to, to please join us in those hymns. Um, we will continue these broadcasts until such time that we are once again able to gather together as God's people in his house, but in the meantime, uh, while you are at your homes and we are here, we take and join in giving thanks and praise to God for his countless blessings. And we begin by singing our opening hymn, number 908, Lord, open now my heart to hear. your confession, I, by virtue of my office as a called and ordained servant of the word, announce the grace of God unto you. And in the stead and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all of your sins in the name of the Father, and of the 
the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. My eyes are ever toward the Lord, for he will pluck my feet out of the net. One thing have I asked of the Lord, that do I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord in all the days of my life to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord, and to inquire in his temple. For he will hide me in his shelter in the day of trouble. He will conceal me under the cover of his tent. He will lift me high upon the rock. And now my head shall be lifted up above my enemies all around me. And I will offer in his tent sacrifices with shouts of joy. I will sing and make melody to the Lord. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. My eyes are ever toward the Lord, for he will pluck my feet out of the net. Sunday in Lent is from the prophet Isaiah, the 42nd chapter. For a long time I have held my peace. I have kept still and restrained myself. Now I will cry out like a woman in labor. I will gasp and pant. I will lay waste mountains and hills and dry up all their vegetation will turn the rivers into islands and dry up the pools. And I will lead the blind in the way that they do not know, and paths that they have not known. I will guide them. I will turn the darkness before them into light, the rough places into level ground. These are the things I do, and I do not forsake them. They are turned back and utterly put to shame, who trust in carved idols, who say to metal images, you are our gods. Hear, you deaf, and look, you blind, that you may see. Who is blind but my servant, or deaf as my messenger whom I send? Who is blind is my dedicated one, and blind is the servant of the Lord sees many things, but does not observe them. His ears are open, but he does not hear. The Lord was pleased for his righteousness' sake to magnify his law and make it glorious. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. O come, let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. A 
Our epistle is from Paul's letter to the church at Ephesus, the fifth chapter. At one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of the light, for the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true. And try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them, for it is shameful even to speak of these things that they do in secret. But when anything is exposed by the light, it becomes visible. For anything that becomes visible is light. Therefore, it says, Awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. With you is the fountain of life, in your light do we see light. The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the ninth chapter. <laughs> Jesus answered, It was not that this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Having said these things, he spit on the ground and made mud with the saliva. Then he anointed the man's eyes with the mud, and said to him, Go, wash in the pool of Siloam, which means scent. So he went and washed and came back seeing. They brought to the Pharisees the man who had formerly been blind. Now it was a Sabbath day when Jesus made the mud and opened his eyes. So the Pharisees again asked him how he had received his sight. And he said to them, He put mud on my eyes, and I washed, and I see. Some of the Pharisees said, This man is not from God, for he does not keep the Sabbath. But others said, How can a man who is a sinner do such signs? And there was a division among them. So they said again to the blind man, what do you say about him, since he has opened your eyes? He said, He is a prophet. They answered him, You were born in utter sin, and would you teach us? And they cast him out. Jesus heard that they had cast him out, and having found him, he said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? He answered, and who is he, sir, that I may believe in him? Jesus said to him, You have seen him, and it is he who is speaking to you. He said, Lord, I believe, and he worshipped him. Jesus said, For judgment I came into this world, that those who do not see may see, and those who see may become blind. Some of the Pharisees near him heard these things and said to him, Are we also blind? Jesus said to them, If you were blind, you would have no guilt. But now that you say we see, your guilt remains. This is the Gospel of the Lord. <laughs> Father Almighty, 
maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten of God made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came out from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man, and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father. And then he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church, I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. We continue with the hymn of the day, hymn number 972.
No ordinary human being ever won a gold medal at the Olympics. The greatest athlete I ever knew growing up was my best friend's little brother. He could throw a baseball a mile and a half and never even break a sweat. He could hit anything anybody pitched to him, and he could feel like you wouldn't believe and he wasn't good enough for the major leagues. Professional athletes are a breed apart, they just are. They're gifted in ways that ordinary people can't comprehend. I could work out from morning till night in the best gym with the best trainers and never look like Arnold Schwarzenegger. I'm just not gifted that way. Most of us aren't. You just can't take an ordinary bench warmer like me and make him an all-star pro linebacker. Those guys are extraordinary. The worst player in the NBA is an athlete beyond anything most of us can imagine. Ordinary doesn't do extraordinary. Unless Jesus is involved. Today's Gospel speaks of the power of God to do extraordinary things with ordinary means. In our text, Jesus gives sight to a man born blind, and he does it with a hunk of mud. Made with his spit, I might add. The Pharisees couldn't believe it. They called him a sinner. They didn't believe the man was born blind until they asked his parents. Lovely bunch, these Pharisees. They really tried Jesus' patience. But you see, he understands ordinary. Psalm 103 reminds us that he knows our frame. He remembers that we are dust. He knew what the typical reaction to him would be. It was sad for him, I'm sure, to reach out to these people only to have them reject him. But oh, he was extraordinary. He never gave up. He kept on trying, knowing that every now and then he would find someone who would believe in him. He says in our text, As long as I am in the world, I have the lights of the world. Even though it cost him dearly, and he knew it would, he persisted in shining his light into the darkness. Time was limited, so he worked tirelessly doing the works of his father who had sent him before his time ran out. On the day mentioned in our text, he was walking with his disciples, and he saw this man who was born blind. Now, hundreds of people had seen this guy before, even the disciples. But Jesus looked at him in a different way. It was quite an extraordinary look. Sure, he saw what everybody else saw. He saw a man who lived in a world of darkness, that he had never seen the light of day or any of the beauties of nature. He was a man who was dependent on others for his safety and well-being, who, who might have enjoyed working for a living, but was forced to beg to stay alive. But Jesus also saw something that ordinary people couldn't see. He saw that this man had a strong faith, that even though his days were filled with darkness, there was daylight in his soul. Here was a believing Israelite waiting for his Messiah, trusting in the one whom God would send as his deliverer. He didn't know who that Savior was, but he believed in the one who was to come. That extraordinary gaze of Jesus was followed by compassionate action. Jesus anointed the blind man's eyes with mud and instructed him to go and wash in the pool of Siloam. Very ordinary means. You can't get much more ordinary than mud. And yet, 
the extraordinary happened. The man's sight was completely restored. Extraordinary. Ordinary means for an extraordinary thing. Actually, this is pretty typical for God. He often does extraordinary things through ordinary means. The problem is that we're often just too blind to see it. We need the Lord to open our eyes to see what he's doing. Look, and he does this all the time. Take the weather. Is there any more common topic of conversation than the weather? We all have our preferred weather. Vacationers like sun every day. Farmers need a little rain now and then. And somehow, God finds a way to provide just the right weather at the right time. It's extraordinary. And how about the gifts and talents he's given to us? Everybody has different interests and different skills. There are things you're good at, things you're not good at. Yet God brings those all together to make the world work efficiently. It's extraordinary. Yet it seems so simple. I suppose for him, it is. But of course, these aren't the, the greatest things that he accomplishes through ordinary means. He, his most extraordinary work was the saving of mankind from eternal destruction. Think about it. People are always trying to save the world from wars, from disease, from political ills. But wars still happen. Diseases get progressively worse. And political ills you will have with you always. And our continued failure to eliminate these problems ought to help us to recognize the extraordinary manner in which God has already saved us in a way that transcends any kind of salvation that we could ever imagine. God sent his son into the world, and through him he removed all the sins of men, conquered Satan and all the enemies of our souls, and provided us the one thing we needed to make us perfect in the eyes of his Father. This we call the gospel. And it brings us to faith, keeps us in the faith, and ultimately leads us to everlasting glory. Only God could have done this. He is truly extraordinary. Isn't it sad that people with seeing eyes are so blind to the extraordinary works of God? But beyond this, as Jesus used mud and water to open the eyes of the man born blind. He takes water, bread, and wine and adds to them his word of promise and raises dead souls to life. He turns his enemies into his friends by creating and sustaining in them faith toward him. Now you may wonder, why? Why does God do things the way he does them? Why use the simple, ordinary things of life to do extraordinary things? Why, why is it that we don't see a pillar of cloud or, or hear his voice booming from heaven? It's easy to think that maybe what our world needs is for God to send fire out of heaven like he did in days of old, to turn an altar soaked with water into a pile of ashes. But he doesn't. These days he chooses to use ordinary things like Jesus did with the man born blind. But still we wonder why. Soren Kierkegaard answered that question with a little parable. Suppose there was a king who loved a humble maiden. This king was like no other king. Every statesman trembled before his power. No one dared breathe a word against him, for he had the strength to crush all opponents. And yet, this mighty king was melted by love for a humble maiden. 
Now, how could he declare his love to her? In an odd sort of way, his very kingliness tied his hands. If he brought her to the palace and crowned her head with jewels and clothed her body in royal robes, she would surely not resist. No one dared resist him. But would she love him? She would say she loved him, of course, but would she truly? Or would she just live with him in fear, nursing private grief for the life she left behind? Would she be happy at his side? How could he know? If he rode to her forest cottage in his royal carriage with an armed escort waving bright banners, that too would overwhelm her. He didn't want a cringing subject. He wanted a lover, an equal. He wanted her to forget that he was a king and she a humble maiden and to let their shared love cross over the gulf that was between them. The king then convinced that he could not elevate the maiden without crushing her freedom, resolved to descend. He clothed himself as a beggar and approached her cottage incognito with a, a worn cloak fluttering loosely about him. And it was no mere disguise, but a new identity he took on. He had actually renounced the throne to win her heart. Of course, we know this parable is really about God entering our existence, taking on ordinary human flesh to do the extraordinary work of saving us by suffering, dying, and rising again. Today, we ask the Lord to open our eyes that we may see in these ordinary things water, word, bread, and wine, all of his wondrous works done for us. May he remove the scales that cloud our vision and give us insight into his love for the strengthening of our faith and the glory of his holy name. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Yeah. Please stand. The peace of God which passes all understanding, keep our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.
Blessed Lord, you give sight to the blind. You open the ears of the deaf and make the lame to walk. Hear the prayers of your people on behalf of all people as they have need. In the darkness of sin and its death, we cry to you, O Lord. Open our ears by your word, our minds by your spirit, and our hearts by your grace, that we may know and be thankful for all the blessings you have given to us in Christ our Lord, especially the gifts of forgiveness, life, and salvation. Strengthen us in faith that we may serve you with all our body, mind, soul, and strength. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Bidden by your word, we pray to you, O Lord, on behalf of your church and all your people scattered and isolated. Give to us good pastors and servants of your word who will serve us faithfully and boldly, even in chaotic times. Keep them safe, comfort them and their families, and raise up many more servants for full-time church work. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Defended by your grace, we ask you, O Lord, to provide us with good and faithful leaders who will preserve the precious gift of liberty and protect the lives of our citizens. Give them special wisdom and help them to work in harmony in the midst of this pandemic. Bless the members of our armed forces and protect them as they defend us. Grant your blessing to all emergency and medical workers who continue to come to our aid in times of great need. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Enjoying the riches of your grace, we ask you, O Lord, to give us generous hearts, that we may share what you have provided with those in need and work for the common good of all. Give us patience in our seclusion and comfort the lonely. Grant relief to the unemployed, the underemployed, the homeless, and all their families. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Knowing your healing will and gifts, we pray you, O Lord, to spare us from all calamity by pestilence, scarcity, and fear. Remember the sick and their afflictions. Calm those troubled in mind and keep steadfast the dying. Hear us especially for her Mueller and family, Merrill Weber, Sandy Seha, Anna Eberly, Linda Greeden, Jim Zeinert, Andrea Thiebo, Warren Lindsner, Oliver Siegel, Safira Walburn, Mary Galson Sr., Todd Brickle, Jeff Dion, Marianne Hollister, Laurel Worth, Catherine Bayman, Dave Jordan, Donna Meeks, Diane Olson, Emma Anderson, Shirley Fleischer, Ann Keller, Mark Becker, Lake and Lesprince, Scott Steenfort, Lee Zaychek, Scott Kohler, Tom Howden and family, Barbara Elwanger, Carol Cottle, Lynn Olson, Laverne Worth, Holly Broman and family, Victor Gilbert, Mackenzie Brown, Lily Olson, Don Schumacher, Norb Pomeranke, Larry Olson, Mona Barkey, Lee Weinig, Andy Sturgis, Rose Kozlowski, Roger Kemp, Joan Reinke, and Tom Drum. Show us your gracious will, O Lord, and sustain those who are afflicted in body or mind until that day when you will bestow upon us new bodies fit for the eternal life you have prepared for us in Christ. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. We rejoice, Lord, with those celebrating your abounding gifts, especially those who have been granted another year of life. Jane Thoman, Linda Ratzberg, Deb Bartlemy, Steve Sexman, James Boss, Matthew Looker, Russ Borkert, and Gabriel Melodic. With these and all those celebrating your most gracious gifts, we thank you. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. We pray your watchfulness over our military chaplains, 
that they would continue to have the freedom boldly to share your word with servicemen and women and their families. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Mindful of your promise, we ask you, Lord, to comfort those who grieve and to build up those who mourn with hope for the resurrection. Remembering the faithful who have died in Christ, we pray to bring us at last to be with them in your nearer presence. Looking forward to that day when we shall join in the marriage supper of the Lamb and his kingdom without end. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. All these things, O Lord, we pray in the name of Jesus Christ, asking you to grant our prayers, not for our sake, but for the sake of him alone. Teach our hearts to be content with your will and to trust that you will answer us with what is best for us at the right time for our need. So do we pray, giving testimony of our confidence in your gracious favor in Christ by answering with one voice. Amen. Amen. We continue on page 14 of the order of worship with the Lord's Prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thank you all. 